If you were to travel to around the year 1780 to the southeast of Africa and witness a battle, it would look something like this. There would be two groups of men, not very large groups of men. They'd be jeering at each other, probably having some sort of dance off before throwing spears at one another. Not many people would die and essentially it would be more like a big kind of sports day event rather than what we would recognize as a battle. Now let's go to the year 1815. Now it looks incredibly different. One of the groups of men charges at the others, surrounds them, and then stabs them all to death with short spears. What ensues is a massacre, and none of the enemy tribe remains. But of course, we have to wonder, what changed in Southeast Africa with the nature of warfare in this time? John Lampier in African Military History describes what came before so traditional African warfare that it demonstrated four key factors that appeared in varying degrees of consistency across the region. Control of people and resources instead of territory, utilization of numerically small forces, conducting raids instead of engaging in protracted conflicts, and rudimentary logistics. So really what we need to remember about African warfare before the period of about 1800 is that it was small scale because the tribes and the numbers involved were small scale. And actually there was always the choice of relocation and moving to a new area rather than fighting it out to the death. So casualties were very small because the tribal groups themselves were small. These battles, as I said, were more often show events with dance off kind of things and competitive throwing of spears. And then basically whichever tribe danced better or threw the spears better would be the victor rather than someone who tactically took the field or killed the most enemies because casualties were very small. And this meant that defeated clans weren't completely eradicated, but rather simply moved off to settle in a new piece of land. Now, this all changed around 1800, and this is partially thanks to the change in equipment that was being used. Now, beforehand, the traditional equipment of the African warrior was the throwing spear, so a long spindly spear that was good for throwing, um, as well as a, a kind of club, which actually in, in Zulu is called the Iwisi, but actually, for some reason, the Afrikaans word knopkili um, is sometimes used in English as well, and for some reason, this was standard vocabulary for me in my household, which I blame my dad for, but we used to reference Knopkili all the time and I'm not quite sure why that was part of my vocabulary growing up as a child but I've always known this word but it's very niche um, but the Zulu word is Iwisi and these were the traditional weapons that were used. Uh, as well, you had the traditional shield that was used which was a small made of cowhide as I uh, referenced in a previous video. So these were the traditional weapons that were used, but this all changed with an individual called Shaka. And this is something I talked about in a previous video about the Zulu Empire, the rise of the Zulu Empire. Shaka made the Zulus famous, he basically put them on the map. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about how he reformed the military and the tactical understanding of the Zulu and basically completely reshaped, completely changed the nature of warfare in South Africa at the time. Now, this is partially because Shaka had a very difficult upbringing. He was outcast with his mother, his father was the king of the Zulus who were at that point still a very insignificant small tribe and, and he faced a lot of hardship he had to wander around and, and was outcast many times and the tribes that he was a part of often mistreated him and he was bullied by other boys and so this might have made Shaka quite a hard personality who then later in life didn't take well uh, to betrayal and wasn't very merciful at all. Now, Shaka, as I already described, became a warrior and a commander in the Mtetwe army that he was serving in. And the Mtetwe were already important, and this is actually was noticed by the king Dingiswayo because Shaka, he questioned things in the military and was an innovator and wanted to change things to make it more efficient. Um, and this is indeed what he did. Now, the Mtetwe were already innovative in their own way. Dingiswayo really led the first round of reforms for African warfare, and this is that he divided his uh, regiments into age groups. Before it had just been all the men fought together, but now he divided it between different age groups so you had different regiments. And these he distinguished by giving them different colors of shield. Now the shields were made of cow hides, so basically the different um, uh, hides of the cow, depending on what color they were, he would give to different regiments so he'd be able to distinguish them and have better command over them rather than just one fighting force. Now Shaka, actually, he went steps further with his reforms and he was the leader of one of the regiments regiments um, in the army of the Mtetwe and he had a real focus on close quarters combat and for this he designed a new weapon which he called the Asagai although it's often known by its nickname in Zulu which is the Iklwa and this is the sound that it's meant to make when this small spear actually went in and out of the flesh of another man this was the stabbing technique that was used 
And this weapon, it was much shorter. It was only 30 inches the handle and 13 inches the actual blade, the spearhead of this small spear. And it was much smaller than the other spears that had a much longer handle so it could be thrown, which is the main way in which it was fought. This was not a throwing weapon. This was a close range weapon. Um, and that's where you get the nickname from. Now as well, he redesigned the shield and he made the shield much larger. He made it five feet in width and then two feet and six inches um, in breadth along the way. And this is important because it meant that the shield was much larger. It now could cover the entire warrior, whereas before you had to be skillful in how you used the shield um, to avoid being hit by missiles. And again, this is because he wanted to close in and get into close combat fighting rather than this long-ranged missile throwing, which had been the norm. And so having a bigger shield meant that the Zulu warrior was much more protected and could much more easily charge at an enemy who was throwing spears at him. He did, have, in fact, keep the old spear as well, but he used this as a weapon that could be thrown just before the charge would make impact so that you would throw the spears and as a secondary weapon and then you would use the Asagai to finish off the opponent. He also discarded the traditional sandals that were worn because he felt that they slowed down the warrior and so Zulu warriors got really tough feet and they were known for being able to travel incredible distances. Um, some scholars suggest that they were able to go something like 30-40 kilometers in a single day. Now whether that's true we're not actually sure but it has been estimated that they were actually faster on foot across rough terrain than were the cavalry of the later British and the Boers who came to fight against them. So this was a really important feat and they were really fit and well-trained men, these Zulu warriors. And that's one of the reasons why he discarded the sandals was again so they would be faster, they would have tougher feet and they'd be more effective in combat. Now Shaka as well, he changed the way in which war was fought. He changed the way in which he thought about war. Um, and so one of the quotes that's attributed to him is, In war, strike an enemy once and for all. Let him cease to exist as a clan or he will live to fly at your throat again. And this really broke tradition with the traditional African way of warfare. As I said, there were few casualties and the, the loser of a fight would simply move away uh, and wouldn't be annihilated. However, for Shaka, he could see that this actually bred resentment and what would often happen is that this, you know, one battle and, and one death would lead to another because then there was the kind of the vengeance, the, the feud kind of idea. It would be a back and forth. And this is something that his protege, um, that Dingiswayo never did. And this is a big difference between Shark and Dingiswayo. Because Dingiswayo, when he was fighting against King Zwide, I mentioned this in the previous video as well, if you haven't seen it, of the uh, Ndwandwe, he defeated Zwide three times, but he didn't kill him every time. He captured him, but he let him go because that was the traditional African way. But Shaka, he could see that actually if he just killed him the first time, there wouldn't have been a need to fight again the next time. So Shaka had this very different idea about how to fight. Now in 1816, Shaka's father died and he was able to become the king of the Zulu and that meant that he was now able to apply what he'd applied in his one regiment in the Isibutho in Zulu to the Amabutho, which is just the plural for these regiments. Now a quick note actually while I'm here is that often the Zulu regiments are called Impi, but actually Impi is the, the Zulu word for warfare or fighting as a whole, whereas in English it's kind of used to describe the regiments. But this is what the, the Zulus themselves called regiments, Amabutho, uh, and then the singular regiment, Isibutho. And he, he organized his regiments along the same lines as the Mtetwe did, but he introduced even more radical military reforms. So he also had them split by age, so the older warriors would be together and there would be younger warriors together and, and warriors of a middle age together. And these all had different names and different dress, so they'd be able to tell them apart. And he also told them apart by the Isihlangu that they used. And this is the, the word for the shield, the cowhide shields. And so basically the youngest inexperienced warriors would have completely black shields, whereas the warriors that had been fighting a little longer would have shields with more white flecks on them, and then the very experienced veteran warriors would have completely white shields at that point. Well, the warriors who were sort of the middle-aged men, they would generally have brown or, or red kind of shields that they would use. And there is also a deeper significance to the color scheme here. Um, and this also meant that each of the regiments, each of the Isibutho, that they would also have a kraal, so this uh, a kraal essentially in English, of cattle with the certain color of hide that they would then use. And this would form sort of the center of where their huts would be around this cattle kraal, uh, and this is, would be where the regiment would stay. And it would form a really strong identity of the regiment, and it also meant that Shaka or whoever was commanding the Zulu army could more easily split the army by looking at the regiments in the shield colors and decide 
decide how to use them, tell them apart and use this as a grand strategy. Now, this next strategy that's most famous for the Zulu is known in Zulu as Impondon Zankomo. And this is most often in English called the horns of the buffalo, or the, it's actually the bull horns, but that's pretty much the same thing here. And how this strategy worked essentially was that the Zulu army would face off against whichever other, other army they were facing, first off just as a mass of men. But they would then split the mass of men into several groups, and these all have different names. So in the center, you would have the Isifuba, which is the chest of the buffalo, whereas on the two flanks, you'd have the Izimpondo, which are the horns, and further back, you have the Onuvo, which are the loins. Now, each of these groups would be made up of different men, and I've, I've shown them there with the different shields. So, the men in the medal would be the experienced middle-aged fighters. They would take the brunt of the fighting and fight essentially in the traditional way of raking close to the enemy and then fighting them in a line. This was the fact because they obviously had to take the brunt of the hit. They would be the main men going sort of shield to shield with the enemy, and so they needed some experience. Now, on the flanks, you had the younger men. These were men who had seen combat, but weren't quite as middle-aged as those in the center. And this is because they needed to be fast. These were the horns of the buffalo, so they would do the actual piercing. The, the metaphor actually runs very deep in this. While towards the, the rear, you had the Onuva, which were the loins, and these would be the completely inexperienced young men and the elderly, very veteran warriors who could still fight, and this would be used as a reserve. Now, essentially, how this formation worked is that the, the chest would lock with the enemy position. They would, they would fight each other. Now, whilst they were fighting, of course, the enemy is looking at the Isifuba. They think that's the main thrust, and, and they sort of ignore the rest of the troops, because oftentimes, these would be kilometers apart, these different prongs. Although, of course, at the regiment level, this would just be uh, close close quarters. They wouldn't be that far apart. Now, the horns at this point would move around like a horn and surround the enemy from the sides. And so this actually creates a psychological effect as well as a sort of tactical effect because, of course, the enemy then ha it has the feeling that they are surrounded and, and they were surrounded. And then if needs be, they could also send forth the loins to support the chest. And this invariably defeated every single tribe that Shaka ever faced with this method. And the horns of the buffalo, as I'll get onto later, actually did defeat European armies as well. So this is an incredibly effective technique. It's been used in, in other places as well. Um, I believe it's a very similar strategy to the one that uh, Hannibal applied at the Battle of Cannae. Um, and so it's incredibly important. Also, another important thing about the Zulus is that they didn't just change the, the military tactics on the battlefield, but they changed, or Shaka changed, the whole approach to warfare off the battlefield as well. So he had a very important spy network, a, a network of scouts, but in front of those as well, he had this whole information gathering team that would set up and, and scout out the enemy, find out their exact location, find out their movements, how strong they were, um, and when they were invading enemy territory, they'd find out where the food sources were before they moved into that territory. Now, I mentioned last week the Battle of Gokili Hill, um, and this is the battle in which he defeated the Ndwandwe, and I sort of already mentioned it last week, and essentially he did this by fighting the enemy where they were weak. They were trying to cross a river, so he killed them while they were crossing the river. Um, he was massively outnumbered, so he retreated to a hilltop, and then essentially used this technique of the horns of the buffalo to slow the enemy advance up the hill until they routed and were defeated. But I'd like to look a little bit more closely at the Battle of Glatuze River. And this battle, again, was against the Ndwandwe. And this is when the Ndwandwe actually invaded Zululand and they tried to, to catch Shaka unawares. But of course, Shaka was alerted by his intelligence services. And it just goes to show that he, again, was facing a larger army. In fact, the Ndwandwe under King Zwide, they had picked up a lot of the tactics that the Zulus had used against them uh, in the previous battle of Gokili Hill. And so this would be a much harder fight. But this just goes to show that a lot of what Shaka's innovation was, was off the battlefield as well. So one of the first things he did was to order all the food, all the grain, to be put in sacks and then stored in remote caves, so that he was essentially denying his enemy any food. He did similar things with the cattle. So he had all the cattle herded away. And so when the Ndwandwe army came, they only brought three days worth of supplies. Yet the Zulus had hidden all the food that they had from the area. So essentially the army came in and then started to starve because the Zulus denied them combat to begin with, staying well out of range. And the only thing that the Ndwandwe saw were the Zulu scouts who were keeping Shaka up to date with where they were. 
Now, Shaka did actually strike because he saw that the oxen that the Ndwandwe army had brought with them were completely at the rear. And so he actually managed to get into the oxen and drove those away. And so that really got rid of their, their last food supplies. They were essentially starving at this point. But he, the genius is that Shaka didn't just content himself with this ploy. But what he actually did was to then lure away parts of the Ndwandwe army by, you know, beating the oxen and making them low so that they would then come out and try and find the Ndwandwe uh, or f and try and find their own oxen. But in the night, this caused massive confusion. And another clever thing that he did was to have passwords among his men so that in the night when they were attacking the Ndwandwe who were looking for their oxen, he could cause massive confusion, but that they wouldn't be confused themselves. So the, the password that he set out was Ndwandwe, and then the other uh, unidentified man would have to reply with Kwobolwayo, and then this would indicate that he, he was in the know, he knew the password, and was therefore a Zulu. And actually, a lot of the casualties in this, this night fight were caused simply by the Ndwandwe killing each other because they didn't know who was who, yet the Zulu had this technique of using these passwords, so they were able to, uh, essentially, to be able to tell each other apart in the night. And actually, what this did, again, was by keeping the Ndwandwe army awake at night, they, they robbed them of a good night's sleep. So they were running out of food, they were exhausted, they were in Zulu territory, and the next day, Shaka and the army, they, they sprung on the Mted, uh, not the Mted, on the Ndwandwe um, and defeated them in a two day long struggle. So essentially that just goes to show that there was a lot more outside of the battlefield that Shaka did as well to psychologically fight against the enemy. And that's incredibly important. Now, after the time of Shaka, um, the Zulu arsenal does change a little. You get the introduction of limited firearms. Uh, often these are sort of breech loading um, and, and quite old firearms that they acquired from the Portuguese, some from the Boers and then others from robbing British dead and there's also a battle axe that was introduced but essentially the main thrust of the Zulu army and, and certainly its battle tactics um, and the organization of the Zulu nation remained pretty much unchanged from the time of Shaka moving forward into the 19th century. Now, it's possible that the Zulu idea of, of moving from cover to cover and staying completely hidden, this is something that Shaka did employ, but it's possible that this was actually with the introduction of firearms because obviously you could sneak up on an enemy and then and then snipe him. Um, if, you, if you do introduce this kind of moving from cover to cover, this is something the Boers did extremely well in the two Boer Wars um, and which the Zulus were starting to do by the time of the, the Anglo-Zulu War. But essentially, in 1879, the, the greatest defeat of the British at the hands of, of, of a native group uh, at the Battle of Isandlwana, this was done by the Zulus using the horns of the bull uh, tactic, exactly the same idea that Shaka had done, and it resulted in the death of around 1,800 British soldiers. An incredible feat for an army like the Zulus against such a technologically superior foe as the British. And this was using the ideas and the reforms that Shaka had put in place um, about eight years beforehand which is really interesting and that's why Shaka is sometimes referred to as the black Napoleon because of these innovations but in an article which I'll link which I read to do a fair bit of the research on this one he actually points out that in some ways it's it's more impressive because Napoleon already had the army at his disposal of course he was a general whereas Shaka really created the army he created all of these reforms and then he went on to win these stunning victories against these other tribes and and, and it was his lasting legacy that the Zulu Empire was created and was able to, to flourish um, for some you know 50 60 years after his death all right, everyone, so thank you very much for watching this one. This has been about the, well, the military reforms uh, that Shaka put through and how this helped the Zulus to fight against various foes, their native foes, and then also against the British. Now, of course, the British did, of course, defeat the Zulus um, in 1879 after the, the, the Anglo-Zulu War. But the fact that they were able to beat the British at Isandlwana, they were also able to beat the British at Hobane, um, and another, I think in Tombe, there was another um, battle that the Zulus won. Of course, Isandlwana was the most destructive for the British and the most impressive um, Zulu victory. But I, I think it's just incredibly interesting, this story of how the Zulus go from this nothing little tribe into being these great military reformers and to completely changing the nature of African warfare. Now, there was a much darker side to this, and this is what's called the Mifakane, which is basically because the Zulus became so powerful, they drove all the tribes before them, and you get a kind of very bloody uh, Volkswanderung in southeastern Africa. But I'll make a video about that. 
Anyhow, let me know if you're enjoying these videos about the Zulus uh, and about South Africa in the comments below. And please do share it around and give it a thumbs up because that really helps me out. And if you're new, consider subscribing if you're still here. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.